everybody on the internet. Waiting to see, we're gonna do our mic check, auto visual check. We're gonna see if people can hear me and see me. I'm waiting for my tech crew in the back to give me a thumbs up. And you guys too, give me thumbs up, give me hearts. If you can hear everything and see everything, I'm getting a thumbs up from my local people. So um, we are here, the Bad Dog Show, and today we are going to be talking all about the teeter. Uh, before we get to that, I'll give everybody a chance. Uh, sometimes people have to leave and come back to be able to get the sound. So real quick, I'll say that um, we are you know, here in the summer. Uh, it's starting to get pretty hot in Texas. And um, our last podcast, last week's podcast, was about training in the summer. And we had our very own Dr. Br Brittany Shesler, who is just right over there, uh, on the podcast with us as well. So if you haven't checked that out, you can go to baddogagility.com and listen to that podcast for some ideas about training in the summer. All right, hopefully I gave people enough time to get on, and so we'll get on to the teeter. We're still good, right, tech? All right, so the teeter is a very, very unique obstacle in agility because it's got height, it's got movement, and it's got sound. Those are the big three, and those are the things that uh, make it a more complex obstacle for a lot of dogs. And then you can kind of tack on to that um, the idea, along with the movement, there's impact. So when it hits, you know, in addition to the movement, there's kind of the jar at the end. Uh, and um, it's narrow like the dog walk, so it's also got that width aspect. So it's, it's a really difficult obstacle for a lot of dogs. And it's important when we're training it or when we're retraining it or when we're troubleshooting our dog's performance for us to recognize that and to really think through um, the different aspects of the teeter and try to figure out which of those or combination of those is what's bothering our dog. And that's going to lead us, sorry, there's in my face. <laughs> That's going to lead us uh, to the right solution for our dogs. So some of the problems that you're going to see with teeters are refusals. So they just won't even get on it at all. They see it coming and they, they just go around it. They don't want to get on it. Uh, you'll see bailing. So essentially they get partway up the teeter and then at some point they decide to go off the side. And, by, and I mean, um, when I say bailing, I mean they choose not to complete it, not they fly off. Flying off is a separate issue where they, they run up and, and to the top and they just don't wait for it to fall and just keep on going into, you know, like they're dock diving or something. Uh, and then the last issue that we see a lot of times is they stop early. So they may complete the entire teeter, but um, they get to the pivot point, they wait there to make it go slower, and then they finish the obstacle. So they actually completed it successfully. You can get cues, but you're going to lose a lot of time. So um, refusals, I think, are most often going to be dogs that are just not comfortable with the obstacle. And so they choose, choose not to do it. Bailing is very similar, although a lot of times if it bailing would point to kind of that movement aspect uh, because they, as soon as it starts to move or when they know it's going to move, then that's when they decide they don't want to be on it anymore. Flying off is a very interesting um, issue because a lot of people don't recognize that that can also be not being comfortable with the teeter because they're, they, they launch sometimes. Some dogs just are very excited and self-release or fly off, but some dogs fly off because they don't like the bang. They don't like the falling. They don't like the obstacle. And instead, their reaction, instead of saying, I'm not going to do it, is to say, I'm doing it, but I'm getting off of it at the, as soon as I can. And, and so they fly off. So it's not always a... Um, excited, happy dog that flies off. It can be a stressed dog that flies off. And then, of course, the stopping early, that is, um, we don't always recognize that as a problem because the dog is completing the seesaw. But I have a great video to show you, and especially for those people with small dogs, that will show you why it's so important to view that as a failure of performance. Wait, wait, not quite ready for the video. Um, so first of all, I want some um, thumbs up from anybody who has a, only people who have a like five pound dog. Are there five pound dogs? 
Okay, I'm asking my vet right here. I, I don't know. So five pound dogs, give me some thumbs up. Give me some thumbs up and some hearts if you have a five pound dog or less. All right. All right, now I want some thumbs up and hearts from people who have a 10 pound dog or less. So give me some thumbs up, some hearts if you have a 10 pound dog. All right, now I want thumbs up and hearts if you have a 20 pound or over dog. So give me some thumbs up or some hearts if you have 20 pound dog. So what I did was I actually took some weights from our workout room and I timed the teeter um, with a five pound weight, a 10 pound weight, and a 20 pound weight. And I timed it with the weight, full height teeter, we've moved it down for a different demo that we're gonna do, but it was a full height teeter and I timed it with the weight at the very end and then with the same weight right where the blue meets the yellow. So right at the contact, the edge of the contact zone there. And uh, I think, I mean, everybody knows that it, the teeter falls slower when the dog doesn't go to the end, but I wanted to get some actual differences. So now we've, we're gonna show you that video. All right, so that went by pretty fast, so I've got a graphic for you guys. But we can see that, especially for the small dog handlers, it is vital that part of your um, ideal for your performance, for your teeter, is for your dog to go to the end. It makes a huge difference. We're seeing here over a second for a five pound dog. Once you get to a 20 pound dog, uh, it's actually, less than I would have thought. You know, we're talking about a tenth of a second for a 20 pound dog, and a lot of people's dogs are even heavier than that. Uh, and that's just the physics of the obstacle. But this is why it's so important for our dogs to drive all the way to the end. And we're gonna give you some of the exercises or some of the different ways that we make sure that our dogs are doing that. All right, I'm back, I believe, in front of the camera. Um, just so you know, uh, the, for the AKC, the specifications for the teeter state that a three pound weight, 12 inches from the end of the board, has to fall in three seconds. So that's how fast the teeter has to fall. It's not an exact uh, teeter like what you would see in a playground because we need it to, to reset. We need the, after the dog goes off, we need it to go back. So the, the uh, approach end is a little bit heavier than the other end, and, and that's the um, specification that AKC uses. Um, so we're gonna talk about all those things uh, in this session. But first I wanna take it um, and look at the sound aspect of, um, of the obstacle. So some dogs, really don't like the bang, the actual bam of the teeter. And a telltale sign that your dog is one of these dogs is that they don't like other dogs doing the teeter. If they don't like other dogs doing the teeter, then it's not the height, it's probably not the motion, especially if they're not looking, right? It's the sound that bothers them. And a lot of dogs can be really sound sensitive about this obstacle. So one of the things that you can do is uh, you can classically condition your dog to love the sound of the teeter. So you could go to a trial and sit ringside as close as you know your dog still appears comfortable and as close as is reasonable given the competing dogs. We want to you know not bother them. But every time a dog goes over the teeter and makes it bang, you can treat your dog, right? And we can build up that association so that this bang, it's like a click. It's no longer a scary thing, it's an awesome thing. And, um, and if you have a teeter at home, so that's great, if you don't have a teeter at all, at least you can sit ringside and just feed your dog every time the teeter goes bang. 
But if you have a cheater at home, you can do one better and you can come out with their dinner. You could come out day after day after day and you could just go and make it bang and give them a treat and make it bang and give them a treat. And like anything with training, you want to make sure that your dog is still comfortable and confident. We don't want to overwhelm them. We want to go at the pace that's right for them. But if you do it gradually, they're going to come to love the sound of that teeter bang. Uh, if they're really sound sensitive, you can put a towel underneath so that it's a very, very quiet bang the first couple of times you do it. As they become super confident and they actually love the sound of the teeter hitting the towel, you can transfer that to the teeter hitting the ground. And then if you want to really um, kind of uh, go over in the training to make sure that your dog is really, you know, there's nothing that's gonna bother them, you could even put a cookie sheet underneath to make an even louder bang. And of course, you, you have to do that gradually, but this is how you can um, take the sound aspect of the teeter and just pull it out and train it as its own skill. The ability for your dog to cope with the teeter making that sound. So um, that's one way that we deal with the sound aspect. So uh, the other thing, the big thing with the teeter that's really different is that it moves. It moves underneath the dog. And a lot of dogs aren't gonna like that. And I would say that um, almost any dog, when they're first learning the teeter, that it's going to be an issue. It's going to be something that you have to train through because it's different than everything else. So um, for movement, we like to, again, take the movement away from the entire teeter performance and take the movement away from the height aspect of the teeter. Got a bug. <laughs> and um, one, one of the games that we like to play to do that is called the bang game. And basically, all we want to do is um, teach our dog that we want them to move this. And if they move it, we're going to feed them. So at first, and with a very, uh, especially with a very sensitive dog, you can start the teeter even lower than this. You know, so it's, you know, when it's up, it's just a couple inches off the ground. And you're basically just going to train your dog to move it at all. And a lot of dogs, especially those that are sensitive, they, they pretty quickly might put their paw on it, but when it starts to move, they pull their paw back, right? It just moves a little bit. When you're first you're doing the bang game, that's a click. You praise your dog because they made it move. The, when you're first playing this, your criteria is the board moves at all, click and treat. The board moves at all, click and treat. When they're doing that confidently, they're no longer doing this and then running away, right? Then you can start withholding that reward for bigger. And so then, you know, bigger movement. And you, then pretty soon you're gonna get to where it has to hit the ground. And you're gonna start to get a little bit of the sound, but if it's really low, you're not gonna get too much sound. So you're going to, over sessions, however many sessions it takes your dog, you're going to teach them to just reach up and pull this teeter down. And that's all they have to do. The nice thing about this game is it gets them used to the movement, but they're the ones in charge. They're making the board move. They're not being, they're not being moved by the board, right? You're kind of flipping it around. They also have their back feet still on the ground. So they have, they feel more comfortable and confident than they would if their whole entire body was on the moving board. And then um, you can gradually raise the teeter up so that they actually have to reach up, like even like pull up their feet, grab it, and then they're basically riding down with their front feet. So they reach up, put their feet on and ride down. So Ticket's going to demonstrate for us. Ticket is actually uh, so advanced at this game, we can't get her to show you the um, beginning stages because she already knows how to jump on it. But this is the kind of thing that we do to isolate the movement from the height. <laughs> And you can see that, like, with repetitions, like, they're just, like, it's not bothering them at all, right? She's like, whatever, you know, as soon as, uh, you, you have to kind of keep her away because she's ready to jump right back on. <laughs> she says, I don't know what I'm supposed to do anymore. Ah, there it is. That's beautiful. 
that's what we would see typically from a dog that hasn't, you know, that's first learning this. They wouldn't jump on with their whole body. They would just jump on with a couple of paws. Scare yourself. That's a girl. That's a girl. Good job. Okay. All right. I think that's good. It gives them an idea. So that's the bang game, and that's a, uh, a great exercise that you can do. Uh, and this is something that I think a lot of us do um, as kind of a, uh, a first step before we do anything with the teeter. So we haven't introduced the teeter as an obstacle. All right, watch your fingers, okay? All right, we haven't introduced the teeter as an obstacle. We're just working on that end behavior. We're taking out the movement and um, doing it as its own thing. So they're going to put that up full height. Want to make sure everybody's safe over there. So um, another aspect uh, of the teeter is that we want to, where we can, separate the height and the movement. And this is where things get a little bit tricky. So a lot of people will use an adjustable teeter. That's what we have here. An adjustable teeter. So they'll start the teeter down really low by having a really long chain. So the dogs are doing the teeter and they're, um, they're going up and it's just tipping you know, this much and hitting down. And then you gradually raise the teeter. And that's a pretty good way to teach the teeter. But for dogs that are having problems or dogs that are really sensitive, one thing that you have to recognize is that um, every time you uh, take away a chain to make it a little bit higher, it also falls more. So just using an adjustable teeter does not let us separate out movement and height. We actually make both harder every time we take away a link. And as dog trainers, we prefer to just make one thing harder at a time or even make one thing harder while we make something else easier. And uh, so that's one thing that with super sensitive dogs can be a problem when you are just basically using an adjustable teeter and just taking away links one by one by one. So there are a lot of different ways that people um, deal with that uh, to separate the height from the movement. So a very common method is the two table method. And so you would actually um, have a table uh, underneath both ends, essentially. And you can actually start with two tables that are the same height and you're teaching, your, there's no movement at all. You're teaching your dog to run across basically a bridge from table to table and treating them at the end. Then you can replace one of the tater, ta taters, <laughs> one of the tables with a slightly lower table so that you get a little bit more tip. Uh, and so if you have two tables and if they both, if both tables have multiple sets of legs, you can end up doing um, quite a few kind of stepwise changes to the height and to the tip and really isolate that. So that's one method that people use. Uh, another method that people will use, and this obviously um, can really only be done with small dogs, you can literally hold the teeter. So you can have an adjustable teeter uh, and you can have it low, but I'm going to pretend like this one. And I could hold it up here and have my, you know, five pound poodle, um, you know, run up to the end. And then when they get to the end, I could drop it, right? Um, and you would do that with a low teeter and then build it up in height. But the nice thing about that, about really stabilizing the teeter and making them come to the end, is that, um, that getting the dog to drive to the end, and we already talked about how important that is, you get them to drive with no tip. There's no reason for them to stop along the way because the board isn't moving. And then you add a little bit of tip at a time. So you can do that with very small dogs, hold it. Um, but if you remember from the video, so when I did the five pound weight, I held it like with a couple of fingers and let go. And the 10 pound weight, I held it with a couple of fingers and let go. With the 20, I had to hold it with two hands to keep it steady before I let go so that I could time it. So, you know, as the dog gets heavier, that's not really going to be an option. Uh, one thing that some people will do is they will like shove a wing underneath the teeter to make it not move. Uh, and they'll use that as a way to isolate the height from the movement. Now, if you're doing that, it's, 
you're, you can do more harm than good if, if whatever method you're doing, if it's not stable. So if you're holding it with your hand, you know, but it's not stable, you can actually create some problems with your dog. Or if you put a wing under there and it shifts, you can cause some problems. So you have to make sure that it's super duper stable. So then uh, the other way that we do the teeter, and this is how I teach the teeter, is with a tip assist because, uh, so this is just a tool that, um, that you can get. And it basically lets you do everything that we talked about, but it's just more systematic. Instead of trying to like brace it with milk cartons, which you could do, you've got something where you can change the height to any height that you want. So for instance, you know, I can put it under here so that there's no tip at all. I can have my dog run to the end and treat them. Uh, and then I can just, you know, take out the pen and go down even just an inch. And now I have an inch of drop. So, um, so that's something that you can do if you have access to one or if you uh, get one for yourself. So let me put this back up and we'll just show you a couple of things about how we isolate the um, movement from the height. So um, when the last time I trained a new dog, I trained uh, doing this method. And basically, um, you, can, you can start low with no tip and go up, up and up and up and up with no tip, no tip, no tip, always treating your dog at the end. And then you can start adding tip little by little. So you're just tipping one inch, two inches, three inches, four inches all the way back down. So we'll show you with um, a big and a small dog because one thing that people have trouble with, with any method, whether they're um, shoving a wing under or they're using something like the tip assist or they're holding it is, what do I do? Sorry, let me grab this table. What do I do uh, at the end, right? Like how do I get my dog uh, off of the teeter when it's not tipping, right? Because they're way up here and I don't want them to jump down. So we'll show you what we do with our big and small dogs. All right, so we're going to have Trek show us first. Yeah, you can, that's what I do. She's gonna put um, food at the end to help her dog drive to the end. And then she's gonna treat her for not jumping and she's just, just gonna pick her up because she has a small dog, she can do that. So we see the dog driving all the way to the end of the teeter and that's what we want. All right, you ready? I'm gonna go get Venture then. All right, so two seconds while I go get uh, a big dog to show you what I do with the big dog. And the bill jack is on the table, okay. All right, so we have Venture here. Hey, bud. Ooh, he is ready to go because we did this earlier. I'm just gonna put a little bill jack up there. I know, come here, come here, come here, come here. Okay. Ready, ready, teeter. Good boy. I'm gonna treat him for not jumping off. The other thing I like about this is that um, he's learning to stay here because he really has nowhere to go. Okay. And so I just let him hop down onto a table. So that's what I do with a big dog. Okay. Ready? Teeter. Good boy. Good job. Okay. And then what I can even do is I can work on, I know what, let's go. I can do things, whoo, like rear crosses and running past the end. Ready? Teeter. Good boy. Good job. 
That's your man. Okay. Good job, bud. Then, all right, so now we'll put him up real quick. <laughs> all right. Oh, I just handed off a very excited dog to my uh, pit crew right there. So, um, if you do anything like this where you're going to um, keep, the, keep them up in the air, that's how I get them off. That's usually the number one problem that people have when they're doing any kind of method where they're like going straight up in the air, is like, how do I get the dog off? Um, you don't want them choosing to go off on their own. You don't want them flying off. Um, but uh, it, I think it actually encourages them to, to stay right here because they're not going to, they don't jump off until you release them. So this is a way if your dog is getting sticky at the pivot point, they're starting to get to the pivot point and wait a little bit, then this is something you can try. You basically want to get them running full tilt to the end again and then um, start adding the tip again. Um, so that is um, the basics of kind of how you want to think about the teeter. Isolate issues, work on one aspect at a time where you can get creative. Isolate the sound, isolate the movement, isolate the height. And when you're having problems, you need to try to figure out which of those is your problem so you can address it. I do have a whole bunch of questions that came in beforehand. So I'll start with those, and then Brittany will let me know what other ones we have. We have like a dude in a, like one of those parachutes, and he's in a seat with a big fan flying across. Uh, oh, yes, yeah, so Trish wanted to know if we would talk about large strided dogs and the up contact. So um, I totally feel your pain. We started out um, agility with a Rottweiler, who would very often miss up contacts on, on any of the contact obstacles. Um, and it is a very frustrating issue because it's, it's not, um, there's not like a ton of solutions for it. You don't want your dog to stop on their way up. Uh, but basically you can go a couple of different approaches. One approach is um, teaching them to understand they have to hit the up. So you can teach like a foot target away from the teeter and then add the foot target to the teeter. So you're basically at that point teaching them, there, here's this square of something or other and I need to, you need to put your paw on it and then transferring that to the, the contact obstacle. Um, but another approach is more of a muscle memory approach and that is uh, to put some sort of stride regulator before the teeter and to really pattern them that they don't come to the bottom of the teeter and launch. They, if they're gonna do any launching, they want it, you want them to do it a couple of feet back so that they hit the yellow on the way up. So that's kind of more of a muscle memory approach to the up contact. Okay, Patty says um, that her dog basically releases as soon as the, the teeter bangs. So in, in trials, it's bang and she's gone. She's on to the next thing. Um, she, it's, she says it's not a fly off, it's pretty controlled, but she um, leaves the teeter about a half second before it hits the ground and occasionally gets called. With big dogs, a lot of times, even if they launch before the teeter hits the ground, the force of them pushing actually shoves the teeter into the ground. So a lot of these big dogs, when they fly off, they actually are, are um, performing a completely legal and very fast teeter. Um, but um, basically, it sounds like the dog is not meeting the criteria. If you want a stop, then you have to um, train the stop and ask for the stop and require the stop every time they do it. Uh, but one thing to recognize is that some dogs do fly off because, uh, because they don't like the impact. They don't like the sound. So they may need some more training on the sound and and remember too that when dogs do things well at home and not as well in a ring you're always adding additional stress at the ring and so all of the behaviors that they were just barely able to do at home and you may not even be aware of it because uh, the difference between just barely being able to do it and not be able to do it it can be very small but um, the dog's reaction to the stress is is now the the performances that are not quite there start to fall apart. 
So you can look and see if there's like some, any general distress on the dog's part too. Um, okay, yeah, Chris Carter says that his dog, his teeter has become a high diving board. So, uh, so I think, again, a lot of times this comes down to just like a dog uh, running through a, a dog walk contact and not stopping, a fly off a lot of times is, is, the, is the seesaw equivalent. It is the dog uh, self-releasing and going on. So we just have to be very clear in what our criteria is for our dog. Uh, okay. Oh, somebody says, Sarah says that sometimes her, her dog will have a teeter fly off and she thinks it's because he can't accurately distinguish between a dog walk and a teeter. This is a real thing, I think, because I have seen dogs, you know, very experienced dogs that will fly off inexplicably for no reason and look surprised when it happens, right? It's not like yee-haw, it's like, oh my gosh, what am I doing in the middle of the air? Uh, and a lot of times um, you, can, you can often pinpoint it to a two-day trial and on Saturday the dog walk goes across the back of the ring and on Sunday the teeter go, is in the same spot and you will see a greater than normal number of fly-offs. So to me again that points to the fact that the dogs are not always completely aware of which obstacle they're doing. So uh, in most organizations the dog walk has slats and the teeter doesn't. So that's one way that, to help your dog distinguish. And what that might mean for you is, if you have homemade equipment and you don't have slats on your dog walk, you might consider adding them because it is a distinguishing feature between the two. Um, and then also to make sure that you are using a verbal for both obstacles and that you get it out early. So the dog has time to hear it and prepare. Um, let's see, Maureen says she's only trained medium to large dogs until recently she got a, um, a mini poodle who only weighs 10 pounds um, and then she can't do a two on two off to hold the board down uh, so she wants to do a four on but even with a four on the dog can get, you know, there is recoil to the teeter um, and the dog can get bounced off. She wants the dog to rock back into a down. And she wants to know, um, you know, thoughts on getting the dog to do that. Well, that's a great strategy for large dogs. Actually, it's a great strategy for all dogs to have them, not necessarily a full down, but to shift their weight back a little bit rather than forward. will give them more stability on the teeter. And so if I were doing that with a little dog and I wanted the down to be part of it, I would go back to the, I'm, uh, I'm running up, into the air and once I had my dog running to the end I would require the down here and make that just part of the overall performance and then from then on the down is part of the criteria it has to be a run to the end and a down and that you have to make sure through gradual training that your dog understands that that's what it is so you may have to kind of rather than saying I have a teeter performance and I'm just going to add a down you might need to think that the down is part of the teeter performance and I need to quickly kind of go back through my teeter progression with the down as part of my uh, teeter performance. All right. Uh, Penny says she has huge issues with the cocker not waiting for the uh, board to hit before she exits. So um, again, the dog could be stressed, but a lot of times the dogs just aren't clear on what their criteria was. That's one thing that we didn't talk about. There's basically, I, I guess there's basically three in behaviors, I would say, for a teeter. Um, so one is four on the, the board. So the dog runs up, they're four on, they ride it down, and they stay all four feet on the board. They don't put any feet onto the grass until they're released. So that's four on. There's two on, two off. Well, clearly a dog cannot at the top get into two on, two off. So essentially you're teaching a dog to be four on until it hits and then to step into a two, off, two on, two off position. And then I guess the running contacts equivalent is basically as soon as it hits, you're free to go. You don't have to wait for me to say anything. So those are the three ways that people will do it. So um, for small dogs, I think absolutely the four on is a really, especially for really small dogs, the four on is a really good choice because they, if they have their two feet on the ground, they can get flipped up. You know, as the board bounces, that it, it can pull their rear feet up. It's hard for them to hold the board down with their back feet when they weigh so little. Um, 
with bigger dogs, I think you have a choice. Um, I, I like four on as an idea because uh, they, ha they have to start out four on. Uh, what I found with my dog was he already had a dog walk. Um, he already had an A-frame. They were both two on, two off. He was four on all through this training until it got to the very, very, very end. And then he basically saw you know, the similar picture and offered the two on, two off. And so I decided at that point that I was going to um, transition to that. But I'd always use a word to let him know. So I'll say teeter spot. And I expect him to step into the two on, two off. And for really big dogs, uh, like the best teeter performances that I love to see, they will fly up. And they're basically sliding in and landing with their two feet on the ground as it hits. This whole, you know, all happens at the same time. Um, OK. OK, so Julie says that she just introduced the teacher to her young dog, and she's trying to break it down as much as she can. How do you get them used to the sound, the height, and the tipping? So hopefully that's, that was basically the point of the entire live. So I, I hope that we answered that one pretty well. Um, she said she took him to a class that didn't break it down a lot. She doesn't want the sound and the tipping to scare him. Um, and she started at the ground, and where do you go from there? So hopefully this gives you some ideas of how you can, again, separate the, um, the movement from the height and just do it little by little by little. And you can play these other games to help them get used to um, the movement and the sound with the bang game and the rewarding uh, for the sound and really just kind of work on those you know, all of those will all come together in, into your teeter performance. Um, Terry says that her dog has a pretty decent teeter in practice, but she won't do it or the dog walk in competition. She gets lined up and veers around. So from that description, I'm going to assume that this is a very inexperienced dog. Uh, and so that is, that is a sign that the dog is not comfortable either completely comfortable either with the obstacles or with the environment and it could be again that that uh, this more generic environmental stress manifests itself in a degradation of performance of other obstacles all of the complex obstacles weaves and contacts they all start to break down so I would go at it two different ways I would um, I would make sure, so you said that your dog has a pretty decent teeter in practice. I want it to be gorgeous in practice. I want you to work up on your training of the teeter so that it is, um, that the dog has a lot of drive and enthusiasm and, and has, doesn't look concerned at all in practice because it's only gonna get worse when you take it to the ring, right? So you want it to be really good in practice. So you work on the teeter in practice and get it really good. Separately, I want you to work on um, how your dog uh, their general state at, in a trial setting. Are they comfortable? Are they happy? Will they play with you? Will they take treats? And kind of work on that generalized trial stress separately. And then when you have a more relaxed dog and a better teeter performance, then you can bring it all back together in competition. Those were all the ones that we had before we even started. But once we got started, now it's on my tech crew to tell me if we had any other questions that we didn't get answered. Uh, Let's see. This one, dog with elbow dysplasia. Oh, okay, so Vic says, question for the end of the session. I have a dog with elbow dysplasia. I suspect she doesn't like the jarring hit of the board in the ground. She sometimes jumps off before it hits the ground, right? So any suggestions on how to make her more comfortable performing this obstacle? So I think the, um, the, the weight shift back um, can help uh, the the um, the down position can be more comfortable for the dogs. It kind of uh, spreads out the jarring over their whole body. Um, I don't have very much else. I mean, the question is, is it is it true discomfort or is it um, a dislike? Like if it's if it's the dog doesn't like it, you can, tra through training, train them to like it. You can turn a dislike into a like, but you can't turn a it hurts into a, into a doesn't hurt, right? That's, that's a physical thing. So you kind of, for yourself and your dog, you have to um, try to answer that question as best you can. Sorry, someone asked about the 
the bar of the the tip is just what this was made of. Oh, okay, sure. We'll do a dissection. <laughs> so basically, the tip assist has this metal bar, and then you just put a pool noodle around it to soften it. And then this goes through the edge of the tip assist, through here, through the other edge, and it has a pin to hold it in. So um, like I said, there are lots of different ways that you can separate sound and height. I like this one mainly because it's extremely um, systematic and it has very small changes. So a lot of dogs don't need that. But if you've tried other things and your dog is really sensitive so that one change in a, in a link can, um, can really throw them for a loop, then you want to try to make things as granular as possible. Okay, so Christina wanted to know if this turned into a four on and then Priscilla wanted to know how do you turn this into a two on, two off? Okay. So um, the, like I said, all dogs to some degree have to be four on for some portion of the dog walk performance. Um, so I don't think that, I don't think that this training forces you to use four on forever. Like I said, my dog offered the two on two off and I decided to accept it. So I think what you can do is um, dis, you can work on a two on two off behavior separately like with a, like a contact board or even just the dog you know the dog walk if that's your dog walk performance you you are training a two on two off uh, you can give it its own word and then as you get close to the ground so that you're it's not uh, uncomfortable for your dog you can give them that same word and ask them to step down into the two on two off uh, if your dog already has been trained, I, I'm guessing at some point they're going to offer, and you have to decide whether you tell them, no, no, we don't do that on the teeter, right, and re withhold reward, or if you start shaping from that point and say, yes, that's very good, and now I always want that. Multiple people asking about small dogs being bounced at the end. Yeah. Yeah, the teeter is a really difficult uh, obstacle for small dogs. It's, it, it, is a, it is a different challenge for small dogs, for sure. Um, so I think um, the weight shift back helps a lot with that. I would not teach a two on, two off. That will help with that. Four on with a weight shift back. Um, every teeter is going to be different. So uh, you, and this actually for everybody recognize every teeter is different and especially when your dog's first starting out there needs to be some generalization to different teeters you may find that one club has a teeter that bothers your dog more than others and so then it's your choice whether you avoid that or whether you um, try to find uh, ways to simulate whatever that teeter does it's louder it's faster it's whatever um, but um, I mean you could like if they occasionally are getting bounced, it could just be the teeter, it could just be they didn't weight shift back or whatever. If for whatever reason your dog is consistently getting bounced, you could decide for yourself that like rather than the very end, I'm, my, my place that I'm teaching my dog to go to is you know 12 inches down or something like that. But you have to recognize that you're giving up time to do that. But you're running against other small dogs. So what really matters is like when you're at the bottom of your height class and you've got, I mean like how big do corgis get? Cause corgis are solid, right? But how tall do they get? 12 inches. All right, so in the 12 inch cl height class, the like the super like big dogs are gonna be the corgis and they're gonna make that teeter fall a lot faster than a 12 inch papillon right that's very small and light so that's when you have that's when you're giving something up relative to your competition so you know in real life you don't have a papillon running against a border collie so you don't have to worry about the fact that you're giving up um, time against another height anything else Let me, I'll you have some questions you a okay i guess that i'll make if you could do yeah, yeah hello everyone Okay, I'm just going to make a couple of points going through these questions here. So, um, first, okay, Sadie points out that the teeter is the most inconsistent obstacle in agility. I totally agree. I personally feel that agility as a sport has kind of outgrown the teeter. Part of it is the big difference between large dog and small dog performance, but the other issue is the one that you're talking about. It's that the... Um, 
performance of the obstacle itself is different uh, from show to show. You know, every show, the weave poles are always going to be the same. The, dis the distance between the poles is going to be the same, even if the poles are different or have a different color. But the seesaw just very inconsistent. So I completely agree with you there. And that's where a lot of the training challenges come from. And to me, it doesn't seem quite right that you may have to spend a lot more training time with one dog who has an issue with movement or sound and, and another dog, you know, that handler doesn't have to deal with that issue. So the seesaw is never a big deal until you have a dog that doesn't like the seesaw. And we've had those dogs. So we really do understand your struggle there. Um, all right, the next uh, thing I wanted to say, Carrie was pointing out that she uses Carrie Crosby. I'm using the tip assist with her students, with my students, but they're still having issues, very sensitive dogs. And that's uh, true. The tip assist is a great tool. Uh, using two tables, that's a great tool. But dogs who are really sensitive either to the sound, the motion, uh, the height, they are going to have issues. They, it's, uh, it, when they're in a stressful environment, it's the first behavior that's going to go away. It's the first obstacle that they're going to refuse. Even when you line them up perfectly straight, they're often going to walk by it. So that definitely uh, happens a lot. Um, our person from Australia points out that there are no slats on the dog walk. So in Australia, oh, man. I, in a, I think it's just the one organization there, um, but you, the dog can't use slats as a visual cue. So do, do you all have a lot of fly-offs? Do you feel like you have, I guess you have no point of reference to know? Right, so that would be an interesting question. Yeah. So if you could comment and let us know if you feel like there are a lot of fly-offs in the organization that you run in, that would be very interesting um, to us. I don't know how quickly a dog can identify slats as a visual cue, but it's one of the first things I would suggest. If you've got a dog walk without any slats, put some slats on there. Well, the um, other thing that I would mention is um, there's the there's the flip side. So when a dog thinks that the teeter is the dog walk, they run off the end and they're surprised that it, it that there's no plank and they're in the middle of the air. But it goes the other way too. When you see a dog that goes fast at the beginning of the dog walk and then suddenly slams on the brakes at the apex of the up ramp and then creeps across, that's a dog that thought it was the teeter until he got to the top. And when my dog was green, he absolutely, it was telltale. You would see him just go up and then just he was in a down and then he would like creep like why isn't it tipping you know so right so dogs are going to have to pick up i think mostly on visual cues hopefully getting the um uh, three-dimensional approach to the dog walk i know right now it's very very popular uh to give dogs straight approaches to contacts a lot of people complain about 90 degree contacts and such but i'll just point out one thing that if you have an angled approach to a dog walk and seesaw pretty slight consistently angle. a mm -hmm. slight angle your dog can see the entirety of the obstacle as they approach it. When they constantly come and 90% of their approaches are straight onto a dog walk and straight onto a seesaw, they're just looking at a plank that looks virtually identical, especially if they're made by the same company and have the same metal supports holding up the contact equipment. So that's just something that I'll point out there. A lot of people uh, you know, are uh, wanting improvement in safety in one arena, not realizing they may be sacrificing safety in another arena, especially with very inexperienced dogs. Uh, I think the verbal cue is very uh, important there. Diane points out that she has to change her pace. Uh, if she shows any forward movement, her dog will fly out the seesaw. This happens with everybody. It doesn't matter how good the trainer is. Even trainers as good. Uh, my, you know, myself with Gitchy, uh, Sylvia Turkman and her dog, she's a wonderful trainer. Uh, Susan Garrett, anybody that you see competing at a really high level, the vast majority of them are not blasting 20 feet past the seesaw unless they were already 10 or 15 feet past the seesaw when their dog got on it. Um, so if you want to get ahead on the seesaw, you can throw the brakes on even if you're far ahead as your dog is approaching the tipping point. So it's kind of like decelerating as the dog moves across the tipping point and that'll keep the dog on it, even if you're far ahead of the dog. But you can also um, work them on not releasing until until you give a verbal command. And that's one thing when they're going up and they're in the middle of the air, um, it's actually very good for teaching that because they are less likely to jump off because they aren't near the ground. And so uh, when I do this, um, I, I gave one demonstration of it, but I do a lot of running past the contacts and then running back and feeding him for staying on. And so I'm, I'm throughout the process teaching him that you stay on there until you're released. Right. Oh, sorry, my bad. 
My bad. <laughs> you want just the verbal release. I, I wasn't saying that you can't do it or that you shouldn't do it. But it is. You can yeah. run past it, but it is something that you have to train. So a lot of people, especially when their dogs have been showing several years, especially at a very high level, they're not going to bother retraining it. They're just going to say, okay, I'm just going to control it with my body motion. Um, Lisa McKenzie and several other people want to know about the recoil issue. I know Sarah talked about it a little bit. The only other things that I would add are in practice, you want to basically create your own shock absorbers. It can be something as basic as a towel, a foam pad, something that's going to absorb a lot of that uh, kinetic energy so that there's going to be less rebound. It's not going to throw your dog off. Of course, that only solves it there in practice and at your house. Um, when you go to a trial, this is something that I think that small dog people are generally very good about. During the walkthrough or prior to the walkthrough, they actually check the tip of the board. Okay, so they will go and put their hand on it, take it down, let it go, and kind of see what the board is doing. All right, and if they feel that there's an issue before the class begins, they're going to bring it to the attention of the people running the trial. And so if you have a small dog, I'm talking about a, a, um, uh, the kind of small dog where this is an issue, like your dog is literally getting thrown off of it, this is something that you want to do just to make sure that there's some uh, standardization of the equipment because it's not something that clubs always check. At least in the American Kennel Club, they're supposed to check. I don't know that they always do that. Okay. And, and another thing um, for large dogs, there actually is a kind of a different effect, and that is that the entire base can end up jolting to the side. So that's one thing I noticed when I put the 20 pound weight on there, the entire um, teeter shifted when it hit the ground because the weight was holding one end, but the base uh, kind of moved around. And so a lot of times you may have to ask a club to put um, bags on the support of the teeter to keep the teeter base from jerking around when the dog is performing it for large, breed dogs. Absolutely. And Jean and several other people mentioned that their dogs do great teeters at home and other practices, but they struggle with the trials. Again, that goes back to what Sarah's talking about. The complex behaviors of the ones or the ones that they like least in practice are generally the first things to go at a trial when the trial environment is a little more stressful. The dog's got a little more uh, pressure and stress there. Uh, Christine points out that her three pound puppy has a better teeter behavior than her 30 frown, 34 pound puppy. She drives to the end and she lays down and the teeter takes longer than three seconds to fall. And the reason I wanted to mention that is because that pretty much supports what Sarah was showing you with the five pound weights. Big difference for smaller dogs. And again, for me, this goes back to why I don't think we should have a teeter. We did a very cool video several years ago. We took the fastest small dog in America, ran him against the fastest small dog. Big dog. Big dog <laughs> in America. Uh, both the identical course from the AKC Nationals, I believe it was the finals, right? Yes, it was a virtual, virtual matchup the dogs ran exactly the same except for one place the performance of the seesaw and it was the only reason the large dog was faster okay so to me agility is agility we don't really need the teeter that's just my two cents okay um let's see i think that is everything that i wanted to cover there that i wanted to add on so hopefully you guys have found this helpful i think the most useful thing about this is when we first started in agility, the way you taught a seesaw was it was a full height seesaw. You put your dog on a leash, you put some food in your hand, and you prevented your dog from jumping off no matter how uncomfortable they looked, and you tried to lure them across the seesaw. And that's how we taught the seesaw to the Rottweiler. And now, looking back, almost 20 years later, it's obviously not a great way to teach a dog to do a seesaw. And so you really do want to think about the, these uh, uh, components, right? The movement, the sound, the height and start working on them. For those of you with puppies, young dogs, new dogs, that's what you want to do. You want to address all of those issues so that when you start to put the behavior together, it goes along much more smoothly. Okay, all righty. All right, I think that's it. We got our Q&A, we got our pre-questions, we got our live questions. So um, thank you so much for joining us again for our live broadcast. Happy training.